and we're live on the nest. Hi, Ignacio. It's so nice to have you here this evening. Likewise. Very excited to be here. I'm so stoked to talk about your book. Um, hello to everybody watching in the nest and uh, everybody who might be watching on Ignacio's TikTok. This is exciting for me. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, we are talking with Ignacio Nicastro tonight about his book, The Trials of Salahan, which is a high fantasy. And uh, I'm just going to have so much fun. We're going to geek out. We're going to nerd out about Brandon <laughs> Sanderson and a whole bunch of other things that we like. Um, but before we get right stuck in, Ignacio, would you mind giving me a little bit of an elevator pitch about you? Okay. Who yeah, are well, you? Me, of course. Yes. So uh, Ignacio Colton and Castro, um, I see. I go by both, so either or is fine. And I honestly, right as a hobby, my full-time career really lies in the arts. I'm a curator and an artist, and I also do like facility management, but writing really became a passion of mine. And fantasy has always been something I've been like super, super excited about through video games, books, movies. And it just trickled into this book, which has now like become my life as many people who follow me and know me, it's all I talk about. Um, but writing and art, creativity pretty much is who I am. Awesome. What, what do you do day to day then? You said facility management. Yeah. So to pay the bill, I work full time as a facility management. That gets me able to be here and <laughs> to live in Toronto. And, and then in the evenings or on weekends, I do my independent curatorial practice. So I also work with artists throughout the city and I also do virtual reality and virtual gallery development. So I also can work with artists from around the world. And I'm just pretty much building a network of people to work with creatively, whether that be through exhibitions or artist talks, any kind of art workshops. And this year I'm finally able to start more like in-person events. So I'm gonna be hosting some in-person exhibitions and finding time to write as well as I work on my next book as well. Um, so I'm juggling quite a bit, but in between each project, I find time to really flesh things out. And I don't know I have a lot in my mind and I have to get it out, whether it's writing or it's art, managing a facility, <laughs> whatever it is, I just, yeah, stay busy. It's about that creative drive, I think. Yeah. If you're yeah. a creative person, you know what I mean. Yeah, and I think, even when you're sleeping, like your dreams are just constantly flooding all the time. Like such a vivid dreamer. I, I can't get, I can't get them out. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, um, you said virtual exhibitions. Yeah. Are they so, art based? I'd love to know more about that. Art based. Yeah. My brother and I, he has the background actually in virtuality and he taught me a bit, but together we use our computer software to design, develop art galleries whether they be like, you know, a traditional brick and mortar physical space or galleries that take place like underground, underwater, like in, in crazy spaces. And we then invite artists from around the world or here in Toronto who work with themes that we work with. Like I mostly work with identity, whether that be about like queer experiences, diasporic experiences, personal memory or dreams, whether it may, or any of those kind of topics um, kind of, build the framework of the exhibitions and then I virtually install them and we've created this virtual hub known as the contemporary hub where you and friends can join from your computers or virtual reality and you can actually explore all the exhibitions together and I can meet you in there and we can go on tours and it's just fully available worldwide and our main goal for that was to make art accessible around the world and like from anyone who's at home or doesn't have access to art in their city and it's just a great way to, a new way to engage with art without discrediting the current existing physical installations. That's awesome. Is this something that I'd be able to drop into the nest as well after our chat? 100%. I can send you some links, whatever you want. Yeah. That's amazing. And how has your experience, uh, sorry, how's your passion for fine arts influenced your writing? Or has it? I think, honestly, uh, as a writer, I can say, being an artist taught me how to handle criticism really well. So working with my editors and working with friends who would like peer review it and give it some edits, I was really able to take their criticism. If anything, I actually wanted more. I'm like, please, like, don't hold back. Like, tear me apart. I need to know how to be better, how to improve. And I remember when I was first getting the book published, my first fear was once it's published and it's physical and it's available, like, People can see it now and it's it's out there. And even at this point, there's mistakes in here. I know there's mistakes in here. That's fine. But um, I think being an artist has taught me how to really hone my security and my passion. 
So I feel confident in the piece. Even though there's some flaws, I think it's phenomenal. And being creative has given me that drive to want to do more. And thankfully, it's also kept me on a certain path. I've heard like horror stories of authors who have like eight manuscripts going at once. And I just can't, I can't do that because even as an artist, I need to be able to finish projects as I do them. So when I write, I stick to one manuscript until I'm finished. And that helps me really streamline my process. So, so in ways unexpected, my art practice has really come in and supported me as a writer. I, I imagine that it's probably very fulfilling too, to kind of live within that world and get to live within that world. Mm -hmm. for an extended period of time rather than having a whole bunch of manuscripts on the go it sounds yeah. like a passion project for you so can well, you tell us a little bit about the trials of salahan yes i can i have a visual to show as well to help okay uh, yes please. so a friend of mine jared Osiver, is an amazing artist and he created this beautiful movie poster for me to help provide some visuals to my characters because the book cover is just silhouettes but the story of the Child of Salahan follows the two main characters, Liam and Ariana, as they travel this magical realm of Salahan. Um, I don't want to, I, I, I get lost in the sauce sometimes. I get really deep in the, the full plot. But essentially, what the story covers is their journey as they have to travel to the six main kingdoms of Salahan. Within each kingdom, there is a specific skill or trait they must learn. Or Liam, actually, he's like the main character. He must learn them. Once he's obtained all six skills, he has the ability to unlock this sacred chamber, which hosts the only weapon that can save them from a returned evil. While they're traveling, though, there is also an unknown epidemic just sneaking through their home village, which is in a forest. And the elves start to fight off an unknown epidemic while Liam and Ariana are trying to save the entire realm of Salahan. So no pressure then? No pressure. Well, they also have no clue about the epidemic. It actually starts to unravel once they leave. So there's these two, the book itself is multi-point of view. It looks through Liam, it looks through Ariana, it looks through their parents' point of views, their friends' point of views, and the strangers they meet in the Noble Kingdom, which is their first destination. And as these, the story unfolds, you really get to bounce back and forth between different spots across Salahan. And as the series progresses, you'll now be actually plotted all over the world or the world of Salahan, um, experiencing these different plot points, which also kind of back to my previous point, I'm trying to make sure I don't get too many subplots going on because otherwise it's going to be mayhem. But as I write, it just, it just happens. You can't control it. So we'll see where it goes. You just need a really good spreadsheet. I don't have one. I literally, so when I first started writing this, me and my friend, we just, Haley Vesh, we um, got a piece of paper and we just did a mind map and we made a bunch of mind maps and that's it. I don't know why I put it on the computer on like a spreadsheet digital. It doesn't stick in my head. So we have to write all of it out and I have all that saved. And even, even that itself, I've already derived from, <laughs> but not too much, thankfully. Now, um, we got to meet, actually, because one of my awesome co-workers here at Owlcrate, who is watching right now, hey, Marina, hey, was yeah. is actually your childhood best friend. And Marina said, could you please interview Ignacio and, and sent me the digital art mm -hmm. of yours. And I was like, absolutely, there's horses, hands down. Yes. Like, if you <laughs> want me to do anything, you, you put a horse picture in, yeah. and I'm there. And I'm so, so very glad that we got to meet and we're getting to chat tonight just through of Marina. Um, <laughs> can you tell me a little bit more about your book cover? Yeah. And why you wanted that art to be more representative of your characters? Yeah. So one thing for me, like growing up when I was like going book shopping, I know we don't, we don't judge a book by its cover, but like I do sometimes. And for me, like when I was looking at books and in the bookshop, like I always liked seeing illustrations or scenes from the actual book itself. Um, I found that kind of like really interesting. I'm like, oh, like what are they doing in that scene? When will I see that scene? So the entire cover, like front to back, is one long, pretty much journey. I don't want to like snap the spine, but one long journey. And as the first book follows Liam and Ariana as they leave their Elvin, oh, this way it's backwards. Uh, they leave their album Forest Haven and they're traveling to their first destination, the Noble Kingdom. You as the reader get to see like the world they are kind of covering inside this book. 
So the book itself, front to back, is the whole journey you get to see in the first book. And the color scheme really was, I wanted something that's like warm. I wanted this, this adventure is, it's, it gets really intense. There are some really dark stuff. There is some really exciting stuff. But overall, this is a really like wholesome adventure between two best friends. I want to really convey ideas of like love and friendship. And I thought these warm colors were really inviting and aim to portray that sense of, I don't know, friendship, love, et cetera. So that really dictated that. And making the cover itself was exciting. I had this idea of like the forest, the castle, the in-between. There's actually also this like little crack in the, here with some smoke coming out. And that's the main villain of the series. So it's, it's like a little teaser Easter egg of what to expect from him. And I had these little ideas pinpointed and I gave it to the artist who I found on this great uh, website, um, 99 Designs. And I went through his portfolio and I loved how whimsical his stuff looked. And I was like, that's it. That's what I want. And he brought this to life. And I'm just, I'm so pleased with it. It's like my computer backdrop. It's on my phone. <laughs> it's everywhere. Like, I'm obsessed with this, with this cover. It's really nice. It's very minimalistic high fantasy. Yeah, exactly. It's that's exactly that's exactly it. Like, and I, <laughs> you love minimalist, but I also didn't want it to be too minimal. Like, I wanted this nice balance between the two. You know what you're getting. You know you're getting. You you know you're getting elves and swords, right? Like, exactly. just strictly from the cover. Exactly. Now, the world building in Salahan is very high fantasy and in depth. You spoke about your mind maps. Yeah. <laughs> so, when you were planning this, what challenges did you face? um like playing the whole series as a, as a whole you mean or like the, the yeah. first book because um <laughs> for me so i i don't know if i'm going to also mention like what inspired me to write this because this kind of stems of into course. the actual way of challenging so this first started when i was in grade 12 it was like when i was 17 i'm now 28 um and or 16 and we had a creative writing class and there was an assignment where it was like write either 20, a 20 page book or the first 20 pages of a book. And I was like, oh, I'm going to write the first 20 pages of a book. And it's going to be this epic fantasy. I was, at the time, I was like playing Legend of Zelda, watching Game of Thrones, like all this stuff was just going on fantasy wise. So I wanted to make my own epic fantasy. So I wrote it and it did really well. My teacher like made a joke like, oh, you should finish it. I was like, definitely not. I'm not a writer. I'm actually going to school for art. And that's the end of that. And at the same job where I met Marina, or not met Marina, we worked together there, but at that place, it was Tim Hortons. And a coworker of mine, she just published one of her first books. And I was very inspired by her because she was only 18, I think, or 17 at the time. So she actually asked to read this 20 page book. She loved it. And she was like, by the way, me and my mom, we actually own AA Smith Publishing. You should finish your book and submit it because I love it. And I was like, oh man. So then that's where the problem came up was like, I'm going to be going to school full-time I'm gonna be living not from home so I have to work as well and I also don't actually know how to write like I don't know how to write a book um so the biggest challenge for me was learning over all those years how to write how to properly structure a, not only a book but a series that's expected to be at least five books long um how to develop characters fully and rounded characters um, truly, I felt like I had a, like a lot on my plate, which is why it took so long to finish the first book to begin with, because there was just so much for me to figure out. And I struggled so much with um, like past tense, present tense, uh, passive voice and um, the opposite, <laughs> thinking of the word. Uh, and there's just so much to writing that I just didn't know how to do. So the biggest challenge of the book wasn't so much the content. It was how to actually make the content readable to readers uh, in terms of ideas like these are flowing all the time. And like, I'm going to bed and I have an idea. I write in my phone or a voice note, anything. And content just kind of kept coming. And where the story itself came from, I don't have an actual answer. It, it came from an assignment. And then that kind of just birthed this whole world. And yeah, that's how we got here. But the, the hardest part was honestly just learning how to write a book. I just had, I had no idea. But I learned a lot from my publisher's and my editor. My editor taught me a tremendous amount about writing. That's amazing. Did you have any other resources that you looked to? Mm, mostly just books I was reading. So 
And the best way to learn as a writer is to read. Um, and I would just find myself reading to see what in books I liked and what I did not like. Uh, one thing I actually was not very good at was recognizing tropes. Like even when I was writing this book, I didn't really have tropes in mind. I was just writing the story for the story. And I remember when I started TikTok, that's when I started to become really, really aware of tropes. Like I didn't realize that they were like called those things. So uh, reading books really was how I taught myself to write more. And then every now and then I would like Google like random like forums. Uh, at the time, Tumblr was big. So Tumblr had a lot of advice for me as well. And I think because my publisher just published her first book as well. She was a really great asset to have for questions and for advice. And my friends, I would, it would email my friends chapters as they were written and they'd give me feedback and they helped guide me in the right direction because I was too close to the project, of course, and I needed that outside source to really keep me on track. That's wonderful. Okay, let's talk about tropes. Okay. Now, did you have a lot of tropes in your book? No. Um, I don't. And, I, and even like if someone were, like right now, if you were to say, what are your tropes? I, I wouldn't even know how to answer that question because I still don't even like fully know what this like list of tropes looks like. I don't have like enemies to lovers. I don't have, um, what are some other ones I'm trying to think of right now on the spot? I can't think of any. But when I was writing this book, like it wasn't in the sense of there were certain things inspired by other books, like certain like uh, plot points. Truly, like I had like, the idea of here's where the character is going to start and here's where they have to eventually end up. Just make it kind of happen. And as I was writing it, I can still remember like vaguely the, the feeling of it, which was not, I never, I did try at one point to force the story to, to meet certain points. And it was awful. It was like, it was just too, too forced. Um, reading it felt rigid. So I stopped doing that and I just started to like, like the characters speak for themselves so any tropes that may have come up were not intentional and I don't even recognize them because I just was writing as a character were living and breathing in my head. And when I, when I first started marketing it, one thing for TikTok is they love to market based off tropes. And I was like, shit, like I don't even know like, how, to, how to use that to my advantage because I don't use those really in my book, except for this grand adventure. I always explain this book as a grand adventure. I think about like, Frodo and Sam, like traveling, I think of just any other duo or any other singular character who's having this massive journey. That's like the biggest feeling I get from the book. And I try to portray to potential readers. It's that, it's that, you know, triumph against the big bad. Ex exactly. Like the big win and meeting like the great people along the way. I found writing this book, I thought like my main characters were going to be like, the best people in the whole series and I almost love my side characters more at moments there's times when I'm reading the book and I'm like when Jody you two are actually triumphant you two are the best and like they were uh, back then they were so non flesh they were just you know secondary characters who support the main character but as you read it like they become main characters and I think the people that Liam and Ariana meet on their journey make the journey itself so much more satisfying uh, and I, I'm really excited to see where those stories go because once Lee and Ariana have to travel somewhere else, their friends still have journeys of their own now. So it's like everyone's story starts to evolve and it's no longer... The reason why I didn't put Liam's name in the title of the book, because it's not just his story. Uh, at one point it may have been, but he's just the main character like to save the world maybe, but he's not the main character. The story depends on all these characters to come together and the stories all start to unfold over time. And I think that's like the most enriching part of it. So when you were writing, I, I have a sneaky suspicion here, Ignazia, that when you're thinking about this, this is like maladaptive daydreaming almost. <laughs> Are you having this adventure in your own mind? 100%. Like all the time. Like I'll be sitting and I'm just like, I'm gone. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, what are my characters up to? What are, what are they doing now? Where are they going to go? Like it's... When I was writing this one, I haven't started the second one, which people are upset about, but um, as I'm preparing to start the second one, I'm constantly just thinking, like, what are they up to? Because like, they're to me, they're real. You know, they live in my head. They have full personalities. They have childhoods. They have futures. So yeah, I'm almost always just 
daydreaming about what's going on in this fantasy world. And then I start to think like, what's happening to the people who we didn't even get to meet yet? Like, where are they up to? How are they spending their time until they come to the spotlight? It's just constantly playing all the time. That's a really beautiful way of writing. And so that definitely probably makes you a little bit more of a pantser than a plotter when it comes to writing. I've heard that word used before. How do you mean? Explain. So <laughs> panthers write without a lot of structure, whereas yeah. plotters need to have every scene kind of laid out or at least have like a start and stop point mm-hmm. or an idea of like the overall structure of their book. No structure. I like, I have the, the main, I guess, the main, main biggest plot points, but they're very malleable. Like they can shift and change, but they're still somewhat of a direction. I have I have no clue what's gonna happen in the next book. And I, I'll find out as I'm writing it. Cause otherwise I just, yeah, I, I, it feels too forced to me. I need, I need Liam and Ariana and the rest of them to figure it out with me essentially. Those are sometimes the, my favorite books. Yeah. When an yeah. author straight up says, I have no idea what's going on. The the characters will tell me. Mm-hmm. I think it it does show. I can't think of an example right now, but there was something I read last year and I was reading it. And I'm like, I feel like we just forced our way to that plot point. It didn't feel like it made sense, but you made it happen, which is great. But it just, it didn't feel like a, a very natural way to get there. And that is something I'm very cognitive. I want to make sure I don't force my readers into a direction. I want them to experience it as if they're there with the characters. You definitely want it to feel a little bit more organic. Organic. That's the word I was trying to think of. Yeah. That's okay. (laughs) Sometimes I have the word. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I have the whimsy. Mm. At all times I have the whimsy. (laughs) Uh, How did you develop the magic system within Salahan and you're not allowed to say that you just dreamt it. I didn't dream it, thankfully. <laughs> so I went back and forth on the system actually. So at one point there were going to be wands, but then I decided not wands, at least not now and not for the elves for sure. Cause like I've never seen wands with elves and stuff. And I just didn't want to start now. I love like the body magic. And when I was making this magic system, Again, I was drawing mostly inspiration from actually video games and TV, not so much books. So Legend of Zelda was honestly one of my biggest inspirations. Um, And Avatar was another one as well. So I just thought about how these people are able to use their bodies to create magic. And I wanted every spell that exists to be somewhat um, derivative of like the body. So heat, temperature, like the life forms, um, water, trying to else, wind, things are like natural elements to our world that the body can somewhat produce. You know, we can like blow, we can whatever. Mm-hmm. So trying to think of how that works while giving it a little bit of a tweak. So there's some more control to it. So there is abilities like to, like, to grab things from far away and to like to move them. Um, kind of like telekinetic so it's still like the mind and I wanted those to really flesh out through magic systems but they had to be like coming from the body so it's not like I can they can just stand there and like with their mind like cast a fire they need to use their hands I think actually shadow and bone they do that as well where they have to be able to use their hands to cast their spells and this one the magic system isn't tied to just hands it's literally like it could be hands or feet there's a point where a character has to like kick wind and it doesn't come from like around their foot. It comes from so like it's the idea that they need to be able to use their bodies to cast spells. I yeah, and it makes it feel a little bit more plausible, which then of course makes it feel a little bit more immersive. Yes, exactly. And there's a there is an element where I, I, when I again was playing with the idea of wands and stuff, and I thought it does make sense in some ways, like using the wand as a conduit for the magic. And I still might explore that in the future. If not this book, maybe a different series. But yeah, there's something about like just like the physical body magic and also like incantations. So there's a mixture of when they're growing up and learning magic, they have to use the words 
the words are almost like the wand. The words are the conduit for the magic to be expelled from the body. But once you become talented enough, you're able to use those spells without the words. So it's very much like a progression thing. You have to get more adept at your use of magic to then be able to use speechless spells. Now, one of your characters grows up without magic. Yes. Can you tell us whether or not that was a deliberate choice and or whether or not it was something that your brain just took you on in a journey? And what is it that inspired that particular character? Yes. So that character is the main character, Liam. And this idea of the mag magic list life is part of his journey as the main character. So I guess actually one of the tropes is the chosen one trope, but not necessarily the chosen one. He's just the only one left. So whatever that trope is called, but essentially the way the magic works in the Child of Salahan is the six governing kingdoms of Salahan each have a, um, a kin, what I call them, the, the leader of, of each kingdom. And each one of them has a symbol ingrained on their hand, which you can see in the front of the book, these symbols here. And that's pretty much like the mark of like the ruler. It's like a birthmark essentially. And once all six of those people are together, they can unlock the chamber together. That was the idea. In order to like, to save the world and obtain this really, really strong weapon, it had to be, you know, someone who was worthy of upholding it, which was the leaders of the realm. However, in this world, the evil returns, the, the evil you choose to learn more about returns and tries to kill off all of them. So once there's no one left to open it, he can open it. Once he gets to Liam, though, Liam is saved. I don't want to say too much about how he's saved, but he's able to not die at that point. And to keep him safe, though, they have to hide his magic because with his magic, he can then be seen as the last living descendant. So as Liam's growing up, he has no idea who he is. He doesn't know he has magic. He's the only elf in Haven without magic. And that makes him very alienated. It makes him feel very excluded from society. It makes him feel very different. Um, that very much stemmed from my own experience as a queer person growing up, having this secret or not knowing fully what it was, but eventually coming to know what it is and coming to know what it is, thinking, okay, I got it. No, joke's on you. It's only the beginning of your journey. There's still so much more to do. So that inspired that part of his character, which also fit very well with the plot of the book as well. And the way the book now works as well for him is because he's the last living descendant, instead of having just one symbol, he has all six, which is the, the full circle. He has all six on his, the Dorfus, Dorf, whatever, of his hand. And as he completes each task, the symbol will like darken as like a, a you know, you passed. Once he has all six darkened, he has past the trial of Salahan and he can obtain the weapon. And that's kind of how the journey of his magicless life came to be. And Liam in many ways, and I think a lot of authors do this with their first books, they kind of try and write by their own life inspiration, like things they've gone through. So as Liam's traveling this world of Salahan, each destination he makes is somewhat inspired by my own life as well. So for myself, as Liam like leaves Haven, the place has been his whole life. He goes to the Noble Kingdom first, and that's his first task. For me in real life, it was leaving my hometown, Stouffville, where I grew up, to go to school and like start my professional life as an artist and eventually a curator. And as I was growing as an adult, I faced certain struggles. And then Liam himself, now out of his bubble, is facing struggles as well. And it's kind of mirroring, mirroring that and mirrors my own development as, a, as an adult. Now, obviously, I had a question here about whether or not there was a character that you've connected with. Obviously, it's Liam, and I'm going to change that a little bit. Well, actually, can I expand, though? Matt? Of, of course you may. Of course you may. What's interesting is you would think that Liam is the character I connect with the most, and he definitely is up there. But <laughs> his sidekick, Ariana, his best friend, is the second. And okay. this very much is an ongoing theme throughout the series and the first book for sure is that all the support I've had like in my life and it's not to discredit anybody who does not fit this bill, but most of the support I've had is through women. Like I've always had strong women in my life 
uh, best friends, my mother, aunts, sisters, etc. And I wanted that to be very apparent in this book. So although Liam is one of the leading characters, majority of the book is women. And they're women who are supporting Liam through his journey. So as he's traveling with his best friend and he has that guidance, he meets people like Alicia, Wynn, and Jody, um, his mother, who's a very, very powerful mage as well, and, and Haven. They are all people who are very prominent in the book. But Ariana is a character who I really, really connected with as well. And I never, when I was writing the book, my publishers were like, why don't you just swap the characters? Because like, it almost seems like Ariana is like more like uh, of a draw for me. But um, I just, I really love how confident she is. She's almost like all the things I wish I was growing up, essentially. So all the qualities I didn't think I possessed, I kind of put into Ariana. And she travels with Liam, who is like the metaphorical me, and helps guide me to become the thing I'm trying to become. So would you say it was more difficult to write from Liam's point of view? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really yeah. was. I found like I found if I was when I was writing Liam, and I think this is also again another thing a lot of authors struggle with, but it felt like he was too he was too dimensional. He was too flat almost sometimes. And I think even one friend of mine gave me good feedback where she was like, Liam's just like he's too nice, he's too good. Like there needs to be more flaws to him. And I was like, Oh, like you're right. And like it's so hard to, to portray that. And eventually I got there, which is which is great, but um, yeah, it was definitely harder to write Liam and Ariana almost feels so natural to write. And now Liam does, thankfully, but um, at first I definitely felt a little bit of a resistance to the character. Do you think it's because you at all had to look at your own personal flaws because you were writing from that perspective? Yeah, and I tried, really tried to not make it too obvious <laughs> that it was me in that, in that spot too. So it was like, how do I craft this character without giving too much away and it being too because also too when you're writing a book you know everyone dreams to become a famous published author but you know it's going to start with your friends and family so you know your friends and family are reading it first and you don't want them to kind of already know what's going to happen with the character so I want to make him a bit different from myself while still staying true to some roots how did you challenge yourself while writing in that way in that um, way yeah like when you when you had to include certain bits that your friends and family wouldn't expect how did you challenge yourself i think more so, more so it was one piece of advice from my publishers that helped me do that was to raise the stakes um so to try and just put liam not too forcefully but like try and put him in positions that would challenge his morals or challenge his being um and make him uncomfortable I, I feel like I grew the most these last 10 years by being uncomfortable. Um, so I wanted to put Liam in a position where he had to be like, do I cross a line? Do I not cross a line? Do I listen to the rules? Do I break the rules? I was not a rule breaker growing up. So it's like, it was making him try and do those things that would also, again, give him character development. Like that was one big thing too, was keeping in mind he is a character who belongs to the story, who readers are going to resonate with and he needs to grow. Um, he may grow faster, he may grow slower than me. And putting him in those positions really helped, really challenged me. I actually remember there were parts with my editor where, and she was like, I think the, the most ruthless of like the feedback, which was phenomenal, where she would challenge me with certain questions and ask me like, why this and why that? And I never sitting there in person like, ooh, I don't know. Or like, I don't really have an answer for you. And she's like, well, get an answer, you know, like have an answer for it. And that helped push me to push the characters and Liam as well. That's wonderful. Almost like a mentor to you through this whole process. And it was, it's funny because it was her first time ever like doing like professional editing because she was going to school at the time um, for publishing or editing. I forget the actual exact thing. But so when she was giving me these feed, these notes and having these meetings with me, I was like, are you serious? You're so good at this. <laughs> it's kind of scary. And I, I did, um, the most of this came from her. Like my experience working with my editor is what really, really finalized and polished this, this book. And the future of the series too, honestly. Because more is to come. Mm -hmm. Especially the book two that everybody keeps asking about. Oh, oh my gosh. Come on, Ignacio. What are you well, doing? The thing, a quick rant, if I may, 
is like, um, so a, a big thing like for series is people want to wait till the series is done until they buy it and read it. And it's like, I can't afford to write until I sell enough of book one. And I never, I had, I was selling some books last year at a convention and this guy came up to me and he was like, oh, it looks great. It sounds great. But when's book two going to come? And I'm like, honestly, it might be a year or two. And he was like, I'll, I'll wait then. I was like, dude, like I'm literally spending my time here, not getting paid so I can sell more books, you know, and write more books. So yeah, I need to get more books done so I can then write more. <laughs> Endless cycle. Some folks are completionists. Yeah. That's the word that I use for it. Yeah. I have some friends who will not touch a series before it's done. I'm okay with it. I, I'll read the first book and I'll wait. I'm cool. I like, I think- I've been me, waiting for this, this series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Twelve years. <laughs> Everyone is, and I've been compared to that weight. I'm like, no, I won't do that. Hopefully, like, <laughs> we'll see. So that should be your next answer. It'll be done before humanity ever gets the winds of winter. <laughs> that is, that's a vow I'll make to myself right now. It's on camera. It's recorded. If it's not out by then, this was actually all AI. It wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> um. Did you have any particular parts of the Trials of Salahan that you found di particularly difficult to write? Um, yes. Any sad uh, and comfy stuff? So for the book and part of the like relationship to my own personal journey, um, as Liam and Ariana, they're both characters of color who exist in Haven, like this forest. And they travel to the Noble Kingdom, which almost is a representation. The Noble Kingdom almost represents like our world, like modern day society, not in terms of technology, but in terms of like morals and like, you know, certain oppressions that exist. So when Liam and Ariana are traveling to the kingdom, they start to realize that the kingdom operates differently based off of class. And not just, I'm not talking like just race, I'm talking like intersectional, like race, class, ability, wealth, mm -hmm. age, et cetera. So navigating that discussion of intersectionality in this fantasy world um, was difficult because I, had, I was very cognitive. I'm a white man, like clearly. And I had to try and write these experiences into the book because me as a white man was navigating what it was like in the real world for my friends who I have come to love dearly. And I wanted these characters to experience that as natural as possible without that becoming the plot of the book. The book isn't about that at all I think there's actually only three scenes on it really but they were very important scenes because they spoke to Liam's character they spoke to his growth they spoke to Ariana's experiences as not only a woman but a woman of color in this kingdom and her intersectional identity so that was dark that was very difficult but again having the support I had from my publishers and from my friends who were editing it I had that um sensitivity reading that really helped guide me in the right direction and keep the story true and realistic while being in a fantasy. I didn't want this fancy book to become too real, but there were elements I wanted to hit close to home because as a YA book, this is going to be impressionable for young adults and for maybe people who are in high school. And I want them to learn the things that I didn't necessarily have growing up in such a small white town. So that's the goal of that. Yeah, still though. Yeah, love you. Love you so much. But yeah, that was probably the hardest part was making sure as well that it didn't come off as ignorance or like white ignorance. I didn't want to include any like white fragility or that kind of stuff, but there were still important topics to bring up without it getting covered, without that taking away from the story. And I think, I think it was the author of Red Crown, is that what it's called? Um, I have the book here somewhere. I don't know. There's an author. Queen? Red Queen. Sorry. Yes. Um, Victoria. Victoria yes. So she has like diversity and queer characters and all that stuff in her books, but she never markets her books with those, those like tags. She never says, I write queer characters. I write diverse characters. Cause she's like, I'm literally like a white woman, a cis straight white woman. So I'm not going to try and like make a profit off these characters. Like they exist in my world. But like, that's not what I'm marketing. I'm marketing the story and the characters. And that's precisely what I do with Chala Salahan. The book does cover queer characters eventually. There's not a strong queer presence in book one. It's hinted at, but book two 
going to be very queer. Um, but uh, queerness, diversity, class, age, ableism, these things are touched upon throughout the entire series. But I don't market the book in that lens because it, it feels kind of gross to market it in that lens. I don't want people to try and think I'm making a sale of it because that's not the goal. Um, the goal is to get people to have a great time reading this book um, and to inform themselves of those topics as they come up. I, yeah, I would say that you wrote it intentionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, very intentionally, yes. Which is wonderful, and it's needed in, in the YA sphere. It really is, and I think YA also gets a bit discredited sometimes because they think it's too juvenile, when it's, it's not. Like, a lot of YA is really, really hard-hitting, like, good stuff, and almost learn more from YA than I have from high like adult fantasy. So but tweets to Rome. What, what are some of your favorite YA books? Um, so I honestly, when you ask that question, blank, actually for some reason right away, Inkart came to mind. I remember reading Inkart when I was like in grade oh, seven. Yeah. Phenomenal book. I love that book. I, I don't know how it reads today. I haven't read it in like years. Um, but um, let me think. See, Enkar, I think of Brendan Brendan Fraser, who just won the Oscar. Yes. Didn't yeah. he star in the film? He did. He did, yeah. It was a good, it was a good movie. I liked it a lot. Um oh. I'm I, I can't say her name properly. I don't want to do the service, but Iron Widow was phenomenal. Like yes. truly just it was there were parts of it that reminded me of. The Hunger Games, in some ways, in terms of like the touring. Did you, did you read it? Sorry, um, Iron Widow. I have read it. She's a Canadian author. Yeah, she and she's on TikTok too. Yeah, I, mean, I love her TikToks. They're so good. Mm -hmm. But um, there are parts that kind of remind me of the Hunger Games, where they're doing the touring and the media stuff. But I found, first of all, the rawness of the character phenomenal. The queer elements, the um, visibility elements, the the action, all of it was just so so good. And I'm trying to think of other YA. Oh, I just read, it's not up here. It's not YA actually, <laughs> so never mind. But another really great fantasy book, um, The Book of Azrael by Amber Nicole. That was a really great one. Um, I loved her writing, it was great. I just haven't read something like that in a long time. It's very like monster based. I haven't read about monsters in a while. So that was really good. And I'm trying to think, I'm kind of drawing a blank, but. Those are a few, but most of the books I'm listing off are also books that are like usually women led, like women protagonists. They're the goat, honestly. Like that's the way to go. It's true. And the high fantasy, you mentioned previously that you like Brandon Sanderson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who is a the goat, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So it's funny. I don't know if my friend Beth is watching, but she recommended me to read Miss Born literally like I want to say four or five years ago. And it sat on my shelf for so long. I was so daunted by like how this book looks so thick and like so like so small font. And then I tried reading it. I actually didn't like it at first. I remember reading like, the first chapter or two and I was like, oh man, I just can't. I'm not there mentally right now to read this. And I picked it up last year again and I fell in love like immediately. I truly... Like, I wish I read it sooner so I could have drawn more inspiration from his writing style because the way he writes about magic, the mechanics to his magic systems, his way of engaging the audience with the characters, like everything was just, it was so good. So right now I'm on the second book in his series. And it wasn't, uh, it's a, I guess it's a new adult. They classify it as, um, I believe it's a Parna Verma, Boy with Fire, which is now new name. I forget the new name, but I own the previous book version with that name. Uh, that was her, her writing was so elegant. I really, really enjoyed her world building. I think world building is a really big thing, obviously, in fantasy, because you need to fall in love with the world and believe it. But she did a phenomenal job with her world and with her the way her characters speak. And just her writing, I just... I typically am very dialogue heavy. I like to read dialogue more than I like to read the actual text. But her narration text was was beautiful. I loved it. So have that one on your TBRs, friends. And somebody just let, reminded me that I think it's Jiren who write, wrote Iron Widow. 
Uh, yes. It goes by they, them. So oh, our thank apologies. You. We both mucked that thank one up. Thank you. We won't do that again. Um, mm -hmm. And then with high fantasy, I have to say, you know who's wonderful that you should have on your TBR? Yes. Peter V. Brett. Have you ever heard of him? Oh, I haven't. He wrote a series called The Warded Man. Or okay. The Painted Man. It differs because uh, it's British and American. Yeah. Um, but it is a series about an ensemble cast of three main characters. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a story about how demons come up from the earth after dark. And people have to ward their buildings with magic. That in sounds like a perfect save. combination of things. Hold on, I need to write that down. I feel like you, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my personal recommendation to you. Can you say it again, the name? Yeah, The Warded Man by Peter V. Brett. The Warded Man. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to look into that. Wow, thank you. You're welcome. I like talking books and recommendations. Um, but I, what I really want to know is what do you hope readers take away from your story? Um, I think compassion is the biggest thing. Uh, I think the story that Liam and Ariana and their friends all have, although it has like highs and lows, adventure, combat, really cool magic, all that stuff. Um, the compassion that they have for one each other as friends, I guess the word I want to use actually is love because how love can be translated in so many different ways. It's not just romantic, it's platonic as well. It's unconditional. And there is different love in the book between Liam and his friends Liam and the people he's trying to pursue romantically um, and Liam and his family. So I think those different forms of love are very apparent and compassion and love kind of go hand in hand. So I think like love and compassion and the relationships that we hold and how they help us get to where we need to go. Or if we're having a hard, we have a hard journey ahead of us, our friends and family can support us. Those are like really the stronger underlying themes of the book that I would want people to really take home with them. I love that your answer was love. <laughs> I don't hear that very often. And oh, really? Like, yeah, I think it's like really corny. Sorry. <laughs> or like, no, I, I think it's great. Okay, okay great. Um, and before we get too much further, I know that you had mentioned that there's only, there are only two places to get your book, The Trials of Salahan, currently, as of right now. Yes. So right now, the book, the first book only really covers um, Haven, which is the Elven Forest. Actually, huh. Just do this. It only covers. This is the map of Salahan here. I don't want to block my TikTok viewers. Sorry. Um, so this finger here is Haven, and they're traveling across right to the Noble Kingdom over here. So those are the first two places you're going to be seeing. Um, each place is also like I don't want to. Is like divided essentially by like the class of the high fantasy um, people. So we have the elves in Haven. We have the like, nobilian knights or nobles here in uh, the Noble Kingdom. Down below is Eustace, which is where the mer are living, um, which is what I make mermaids and mermen. Across the way over here is Nanorum for our dwarven folk. Up top is Draconis, where I have a hybrid of human and dragon. And... In this corner is um, Ao so Su, which is another like stream of human, but they're more so like um, earth in tuned, whereas the Noble Kingdom is like technology, like moving forward with like stones and weapons, etc. So there's like two streams of human, and they're called the Octorians who live in Ao so Su. They're typically the original inhabitants of Salahan. They're the first beings of Salahan, and the lore of this whole world kind of derives from them and how they themselves have become each different main species. Everyone comes from one part and it comes from them. So that's where the world kind of takes place are those six main places. I have to say that Ruli who's watching just said, well, you just won the whole chat over with a map and also <laughs> just map exclamation mark. I love maps exclamation mark. And everybody is really very into the mermaids. That's really all you needed to come on here and say. I know. So, and it's funny. So book, it's book got a map and mermaids done. Is the mermaids. So stay tuned. And where the queer themes really come out is with the mermaids. Um, the map as a fun story is designed by me 
and my editor's husband. So he had drew like the foundation mostly of like the map. And then I did a lot of like, some of the small details, but he really went wild with these like beautiful mountains and like, the kingdom is incredibly detailed. He killed it. Um, when I go to any expos, I actually sell the book. I sell the poster. I sell the map printed out on like nice thick paper. I also sell it on engraved wood. I am um, a friend of mine. Her name's Rebecca. She does a thing called um, rigid designs and she laser cuts the map for me into wood. And it's a beautiful, I'll have one here. It's downstairs, a beautiful polished piece of wood and it's the map. It's gorgeous. So yeah, maps are huge. That's amazing. So where can people get your book? So right now it's actually sold directly through myself. Um, or like if you go to any of my links, you can like grab it from Amazon or through like my publisher. We have the links to sell it. If you live in Toronto, uh, go to Queen Books. It's in the east end of Toronto. Uh, they sell the book as well. But those are like the main, those are the only places right now you can buy it. Um, hoping to expand soon. My capacity isn't quite there right now. But um, right now, if you know me, if you live in Toronto or in the GTA, message me on and any platform and I can just meet you somewhere and drop it off. That's cool too. In person's fine. What about expos? Will you be anywhere in person this year? Oh, unfortunately I didn't get a comic con. I'm so heartbroken. It's this weekend and I was so looking forward to being in it, but I just didn't get a table, unfortunately. Um, but fan expo, 100%. I was there last year and it was so much fun. And I met so many new people, but fan expo for sure I will be at. And I'm hoping to try and get into one more, one more festival at some point. I honestly like, unfortunately, that's the, the problem with me running the gallery stuff and then working and then doing the book, like trying to find time dedicated to book festivals. It's, it's so hard. But Fan Expo, I go every single year. And last year I went the whole weekend dressed up as Liam and my friend came dressed up as Ariana and we sold the books together all weekend. It was so much fun. Okay. So we actually have a very, uh, very awesome member, Kiberia, who lives in Toronto. So any members who really, really, really want one of those books, I'm sure that if you message a birdie, you should be very, very happy to send them along to other members of the nest. Oh, beautiful. Friends everywhere. I love that. Everyone's just flying around. It's great. Uh, actually, yeah, Kiberia said, hey, I used to work at Value Village <laughs> right in the area. <laughs> where no the yeah. Oh, the one, the one in uh, by Queen Books. Then I used to shop there all the time. That's where I made Ariana's costume. Was from Value Village. So that's amazing. It's a very small world up in Canada. We're kidding. It's a massive country for anybody who's wondering. <laughs> but we all seem to have these stories where we're, you know, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. One hundred percent. I actually used to work at a restaurant where we sold a burger called that. So even funnier, small connection. Um, and another fun thing too, as a writer outside of fictional writing. I also write like art reviews and get them published in like art magazines and, and little online platforms. And when I got Charles Salahan stocked at Queen Books, the person who runs the marketing for Queen Books also helped edit one of my reviews that went into a different magazine somewhere. And I was like, what are the chances of that? Like it was an online submission for the, 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 the review and the bookstores in Toronto, like, it was just a small world, honestly. It, oh. it is. In, in fact, it's such a small world that we actually only live two hours away from each other, too. We do. We do. You're right. Everybody, <laughs> do think that everybody yeah. knows everyone else in Canada. <laughs> yeah. This is a true story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> neighbors. We are. Mm -hmm. 100%. You grew up in Stouffville. I've driven through there. Gosh. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't been there in so long. I go home for holidays. It's kind of it. Ignazio, I have to ask, did you have fun tonight? I had a lot of fun. Very much. Like, very, it's, it was a conversation and it wasn't just an interview. I, I didn't feel like I was just, you know, Q&A. Very much shared vibes. It's good. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us here in Oswald's Nest. Mm, thanks for having me. So happy to be of here. Of course. I'm going to let everybody else know that you can watch this live with Ignazio and all of our past lives in the past lives and author streams folder on the nest. 
We will probably have this on YouTube as well, which is very exciting in a few weeks to come. And thank you to everybody for being here. It was wonderful. Our next author chat is happening this Sunday, March 19th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. And we'll be chatting with uh, best-selling author Mindy McGinnis, who is the author of A Long Stretch of Bad Days. So you're going to want to join us here in the nest this Sunday. And uh, yeah, happy Wednesday, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye, everyone.